If you would turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, I know, scary times. Book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 1. The book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. I'm going to do something really special for you guys. I'm going to give away the whole story. You're going to read the end of the book, and I guarantee you guys, you won. You are the winners. I mean, the winners. Sorry, misspoke there. The last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. I'll start in verse 1. I'm not making this stuff up. This is real. The end of the end. Verse 22, I'm sorry, chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit. With a fresh crop each month, the leaves which were used for the medicine to heal the nations. Verse 3. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there. And his servants will worship him. And they will see his face. I'll just pause there for a second. Nobody has seen his face and lived because of the separation. But the separation is over. The curse is gone. Now you, beloved ones, saved, called out ones, you can behold the face of God without turning to powder on this day. This is your future in, in our future glory. Get excited about that. You will see his face, and his name will be written on your foreheads. Now, on the size of my forehead, there'll be a lot more written than his name. Living billboard here, but that's an amazing thing. Verse 5, and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or even the sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. And I can keep going ever and ever because eternity has no more clocks. Nothing, no time. No age. It's, it's, it's wonderful. This is where we were meant to be all along, and we will be restored forever and ever. This is glorious. You should be happy and smiling right now. All of you. Then, verse 6, The angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. This is no myth. This isn't no fairy tale. This is for real. The Lord God, who inspires his prophets, has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. I love that, that old song. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the who? The king, right. So, look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. That, my friends, is yins. That's my word. <laughs> yins. Blessed. Verse 8. I, John, the guy who penned this down, the disciple, I, John, am the one who heard and who saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, do not worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in the book. Worship only God. How about that? Good advice, huh? Don't worship no angels. Verse 10. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in the book, for the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do so. Continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous, though, may he continue to, to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. That means set apart for him, for his use. Now, verse 12, this is written in red in my Bible. These are the words of Jesus Christ, the risen, triumphant King, Savior of all mankind. You ready for this? Look, or see, however your translation is. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. 
I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city, uh, the pearly gates as I understand it. Pretty cool, huh? And eat the fruit of the tree of life. Outside the city, there are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idol worshipers and all who love to live a lie. Any philosophy or thing that excludes God, that diminishes Jesus or his word, is a lie. And too many people would rather live that and eat and dine on that. They don't get to enter the city that you and I will get to enter because they reject our Jesus. That is the explanation. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David, or the root and offspring of David, and the heir to his throne. I am the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this message say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty say, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life, and I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of the prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. Verse 20. He who is faithful, or the faithful witness to all these things, says, Yes, or behold, I am coming quickly, soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. And everybody can say that. Amen. I just read you the end of the story. And you win. In Christ, you win every single time. Oh, you're going to go through your stuff. Oh, you're going to be attacked. You will have your confusing days and your dark nights and your valleys of the shadow of death. We all have them. Jesus himself had them. But if you hang in there, if you are faithful and true, if you tie a, a, a knot at the end of your rope and hang on and trust him in all things, he is there for you day and night, and he will bring you through. And you will rejoice in perfection, with no more curse, you will be able to behold His face and live forever and ever with Him. That's the end of the story. That's the end of the book. I just ruined the plot for you, didn't I? <laughs> Did you ever go to the library and just read the last chapter and then put the book back? I did that in high school. Not so much as an adult. But anyway, I, I was taught this, uh, this, this, this wise saying. Well, maybe you're familiar with this. Uh, it goes something along this lines. Uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round. I think round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round. And now here's the, the difference. Some say all through the town, and some say all to the town. Whether you're in the town already going around or already going, that's the denominational difference on that theology right there. But I say we're going all the way to town, right? This bus that we're in, ladies and gentlemen, now as we live and breathe, in this 21st century, this bus is like my dear friend J. Vernon McGee called it the Bible bus. You and I are in the Bible bus and we're headed to town. And we're headed to a town that we just read about. A town where there's no need for the sun. Where it's all good. Where we get to see God. We're headed there. We're on the Bible bus. So put on your seatbelt. And we're on the Bible bus. And on our way, it looks like we got a flat tire. Now, I've been on a bus here and there. Uh, uh, your, your average city bus, tour bus, whatever kind of bus you want to think about, the wheels on that bus, yeah, they go round and round, but they're huge. Did you ever see the, the lug nuts on that big tire? That's, you ain't going out there with a wrench and getting it off unless you're really strong. Right? And I've seen the, the, the wrecking crews and the, and the tow trucks come and they got this big wrench on this big long pole and they get up on it and they bounce on it and it takes a lot to loosen those knots. And then after you get it all loose, you've got to grab that huge tire and pull it off 
and get rid of it. And then you've got to find another huge brand new tire that just fits that bus and put it on. It's a big deal when you're on a bus and you get a flat tire. Has anybody been in that position? <laughs> I'd certainly have. I know Jay Jackson has, even though he's staring blankly at space, saying, my gosh, where's he going with this? Stick with me, my friend. Stick with me. <sighs> Strange things happen when you're stuck on a bus, right? There's some folks that when they're stuck on that bus, they say, well, we don't have the ability or the resources to actually change this tire, so we're going to have to wait. So what do those people do while they're waiting? That's the difference. Do they open up their Bibles and seek the Lord? Do they all gather together in the back of the bus and they pray and join hands? And maybe sing a song or two? Or do they go up to the front and they worry? Gee, what if we're here all night? Gee, what if we're here for a week? And they bite their nails and they're looking out and say, oh, there's some unfriendlies out there. Things are going wrong. And they're, and they're getting all worked up. They're in the bus. Help is coming. But they're nervous as cats. You know? And when a cat gets nervous, that's, you know, you better let that thing out. It's going to knock over some plants. But there's people back there singing and praising and seeking. But everybody, nobody in that bus knows exactly when the tow truck's going to come and how long it's going to take to get that and when they'll actually be on the road and when they'll get the, Nobody on that bus knows. Nobody, not even the driver, knows the day or the hour. But people on the bus react differently. Now, there's also things about this, this bus. How did that tire go flat in the first place? Well, I would just venture to say it was a sniper. It was a sniper. Someone's standing on the side of the road in the bushes. The bus goes past. Here's the Bible bus. <laughs> Flat tire. <laughs> I slowed them down. I derailed them. They're done. They're out of it. You know, there used to be this thing, I think up until World War II, it was called what? Conventional warfare. Ever heard of conventional warfare? This army wore this uniform. They're on this side. And this army wore this color uniform. They're on this side. They were on a battlefield. They faced each other. They moved in, and whoever won the day or gained the ground was the winner of that victory that day. That used to be the way that battles and the way nations went about. It was called conventional warfare. Well, after World War II, some people figured out, uh, well, especially you know, concerning the United States, if I may say, uh, they got the biggest, strongest, well-armed, well-trained, they got the upper hand on just about every battlefield you're ever going to go on. Nobody's going to beat America on a battlefield. Hoorah! Right? <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. So they figured out, right around 1950-ish, we need to be sneaky. We need to go behind enemy lines. We need to infiltrate and lay low. And we, if we're gonna destroy this nation, we can't do it with guns and bullets anymore because they got us kicked. We gotta sneak in there. We gotta get to the kids. Kids are vulnerable. We'll sneak, our, we'll, we'll sneak our way into the school system. We'll get, we'll get the newspapers, yeah. And we'll slowly, just subtly get into that. And we'll get into the media. And, and, and God, maybe we can get an official elected here or there. Maybe they can. And, and the, more, the more stuff we can pile in there, the bigger that gets. This is not new, friends. This has happened again and again. Our beloved CIA used to do this. They would infiltrate governments, sneaky, sneaky, get involved. Stuff a ballot box here, do this here, there, and then, whoa, what happened? Oh, how nice. Oh. Yeah, CIA. And then the KGB says, oh, okay, you want to play this way? We go too. They sneak in. They change their accents, and they get, they get involved in this, and that's called the Cold War. Remember that? It was sneaky, sneaky. It wasn't an open battlefield kind of thing. And Christians, I tell you what, right now, there's a sneaky, sneaky going on. And I'm going to talk about the church. There are, there are people in the church getting sniped. There are churches getting sniped. Do you see it all around you? And, and some of us, hey, we've got some flat tires. We're, we're on the side of the road waiting, right? Aren't we? And help's on the way. Uh, we're not rolling 60 miles an hour down the road anymore like we were maybe in the 70s and 80s and uh, maybe part of the 90s. I don't know. Depends on your theology, I suppose. But we're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop or waiting for the tow truck, whatever you want to say. And it's coming. In the meantime, who's going to hold fast? Who's going to be in the back of the bus 
praying and reading and having Bible studies and maybe singing a few hymns. Now, I've been all over the map. My wife is going to sing the hymns. You ready, honey? You got a hymn you want to sing right now? <laughs> uh, we're going to get on a bus and get us on out of town, thanks to you guys. <laughs> I appreciate that. Been asked to leave. That's okay. Uh, I don't know if any of you know what today is. Today is October 31st. That is Reformation Day. Did you know that? Yoo-hoo. I'm getting to that. Stick with me. Don't get off the bus. Stay on the bus. Buckle your seatbelts. Today is Reformation Day. Several hundred years ago in Germany, there was a Roman Catholic monk named Martin Luther who had this revelation through reading the scriptures, the just shall live by faith. <gasps> Wait a minute. You mean just keeping rules and saying the right prayers? And, and flatulating myself, and that's not the right word. Anyway, uh, <laughs> strike that. Uh, all the things, these, this isn't getting me closer to God. What? What? Some of you are getting that flatulating word. <laughs> what? And they, so he invited Jesus into his heart, and Martin Luther had a Reformation <gasps> epiphany. He's like, <gasps> you mean the just shall live by faith? You mean this born again thing? And he starts reading the scriptures. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. So he, he writes this thing called the 95, or the Theses of 95, takes it to the Wittenberg church door and nails the Theses to the front door, hence starting, pretty much starting, the Protestant Reformation, which we are a part of here today. We broke away from the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and we have said, wait a minute, now see here. And right around this time, of course, he got persecuted a lot. And right around this time, a man named Gutenberg invented the printing press, just coincidentally. And you know what that means? Now we can print stuff that the common man and woman can read. And so Martin Luther set about to translate the New Testament from Latin and Greek to common German. And he took that to the Gutenberg Press. And pretty soon, all through Germany, people had a New Testament in their hands. And they could read the Bible. And the Bible bus, <laughs> the engine just revved up right there. Now, we got people reading the Bible. And the uppers in the church went, oh no, these people are going to misconstrue this word. They're going to change it. They're going to do all these things. And in a way, they were right. But also, in a way, People got to be educated. People got to read the words of Christ and study them. It was an amazing reformation. Not perfect, but it's awesome. So if you go to Germany this day, they are celebrating Reformation Day. However, in the United States of America, in most of Europe, and all over the world, this day is observed as Halloween or All Saints Day. Ah, you know, all that stuff going on. And, you know, Halloween used to be fun. And then I got saved in 1980. And then I realized, oh, this ain't no fun no more. I'm not supposed to have fun on Halloween. And I realized as a Christian in America, at Halloween, there was people on this camp, people in this camp, and people on that camp. Some people were saying, it's the devil's day. Don't participate. Don't do it. Yeah, evil. <laughs> Don't. Okay, and then you have the ones who are clear on the other side. I go, hey, it's fun. Wear the costume, get the candy. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Party, party, party. You know. And then you have people in the middle who say, well, huh? we know there's wrong stuff, and we know there's fun. We'll just have a harvest party. You know, we'll pass out tracks, and we'll, you know, and all the all these three camps. I've been in every one of them over the last 40 years as a Christian, right? And uh, what I would like to tell you, I I would tell you very reluctantly. I would rather not even discuss any of this, but you guys should know a few things. And when I say these things, I'm about to say, this is not being judgmental. I'll just preface everything I'm going to say from this. The devil does not get a day. And if the devil has a day, he stole it. He is the author of lies I do not ascribe a day to him. You know what? My Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. If he tries, 
to steal a day? I say, get thee behind me, Satan. I say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I say, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. I quote scripture to him. He hates that. He don't get a day, ladies and gentlemen. I ain't giving it to him. Right? He wants to steal one. Yeah, bad stuff happens, and people do bad things. If I thought for one minute, I don't know, I don't know, that, that witches were going around putting curses on candy bags, if I, if I sincerely believe that, I don't know. But if I sincerely believe that, I'd go to Walmart, I'd go to Dollar General, I'd say, in the name of Jesus, bless this candy. God bless every child, every adult, people my age, <laughs> who want to eat candy. Bless it in Jesus' name. I rebuke these lying, foul spirits. They're not greater. We win because Jesus is the conqueror, the victor. We serve a risen Savior. We're not giving a day to the devil. No way. So from that premise, I would like to go forth. Are we okay? Still okay? Nobody's gotten up? Uh, bless your pumpkin shirt, sir. I'm not trying to cause trouble for you. But there's something that you Christians need to know. And you need to keep this in, in your hearts and in your, your memories as you proceed and you and Jesus, you proceed as you see fit, okay? In Deuteronomy 18, the children of Israel are just about ready to enter their promised land, a land that God has prepared for them. But in that land, before the children of Israel get there, there are pagan people doing bad stuff, right? They're doing stuff that is ungodly and evil and wicked, God has given them their space to repent. They have not done so. So God is moving them along, and the children of Israel are coming in. Before they get there, this is a warning given to Moses to give to the children that he has called. All right? I know it applies to Israel, but it still very much applies today. Let me read it, and then we'll discuss this. Okay? You still with me? Some of you. Okay. Most of you. This is Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'm going to start reading verse 9. When you enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Pretty much okay with that, right? And do not let your people practice fortune-telling. Or use sorcery or interpret omens, you know, with the chicken bones and all the crazy the tea leaves and the tarot cards. Don't do that. Or engage in witchcraft. Or cast spells or function as mediums. They're the ones that talk to dead people. Or psychics, the ones who demonically tell the future, right? Or call for forth spirits from the dead. Ghosts. Don't do that. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord, your God, will drive them out ahead of you. But you must remain blameless before your Lord. I'll just stop right there. Now, can a Christian put on a costume on October 31st, and have fun. Yeah, I think so. Right. But, if you get shanghai into some occultic, witchy, ghosty, evil thing, and you say, oh, this is interesting, and you wander off over there, and you look into it, and you get sucked into it, that's not good. Can you as a Christian maintain yourself and avoid those things? which bring plagues upon you. That's the rub, if you ask me. Now, this whole thing about witchcraft, it is ancient. And the way a witch works, she gets in league with demons, or he, warlocks, witchcraft, or sorcerers. They get in league, and they can manipulate stuff. They can move stuff. They can curse stuff. They can actually get demonic dimensions into the future. They, they're sort of accurate. They're not 100% accurate. They can do this stuff. It's real. It happens. Witches can do stuff. But the thing is, everything they do is not of God. 
white witch or black witch. There is no witchcraft in Christianity. It doesn't mix. If you are a Christian and you find that stuff fascinating or interesting, my advice to you, according to the scriptures, is get away from that stuff. Don't mess with it. There's greater power available. There's a new and living covenant in God. There is a spirit world, but we have angels who, who are ministers to heirs of salvation like yourself. They do good. They, they minister the gospel. They, they help you. When you get a flat tire, an angel might appear invisibly and push your car out for you. I mean, angels are awesome. Be kind to strangers. Some entertain angels unaware. So yeah, they're spirits, good and bad. You do not want to mess with evil spirits. Now, witchcraft, of course, you don't want to mess with that. You know, stay away from it. It's around you, and it's fun. Ha, 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 you know this, but my advice, Christians, stay away from that stuff. Now, as far as ghosts, um, the old-fashioned generational thing was, you know, there was the ghost here, and I've seen a ghost here. Ha, 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 you know. And, and a lot of people believe that, but the Bible never preaches ghosts. What I mean by that is a departed spirit wandering the earth, haunting a, a nursing home or a hospital on uh, Elwood Road, or haunting this house, or doing that, or appearing to you in a seance and saying, the thousand dollars that Grandma Ethel left is in the drawer on the right hand of the thing. And they go and they find it. And they go, oh, it's real. It was Aunt Martha. No, it wasn't. It was what the Bible calls. I'm talking Bible. The Bible calls that a familiar spirit. You know, he was hanging around while Aunt Martha was doing her deal. He saw her hide it, and then she died. Right? And he went, well, I can, I can do that voice, the demon, uh, the familiar spirit. I'm like, so, okay. So uh, 10, 20 years later, her family gets together. Oh, they're looking for Aunt Martha, huh? Uh, I'm Aunt Martha. I know where the money's hidden. Uh, you know? That's a lie. That stuff may be true. You may find some accuracy in it from a familiar spirit. He can tell you things that happened over here because he was spying or he was hanging around, but he is a liar. He will take you away from God. None of those lying spirits will take you closer to God. The Bible is explicit. Stay away from them. Don't conjure them. And don't hang around people that do this stuff. Avoid it. Right? And these things that are going on up that Hillview Manor or wherever the place, there, yeah, there's probably stuff happening there for real. But these are not departed spirits of human beings. These are demons. Don't go up there and get your jollies from them. Stay away from them is my advice to you from the scripture. I'm not talking about wearing a costume and going and getting handy. I'm talking about entering into a place where a Christian should not enter into. Don't call upon the dead. Don't be fascinated or playful with them. Because there are many Christians. Now, they're not demon-possessed, because that can't happen. The Holy Spirit's in there. No demon's going to possess you, but you can be oppressed. There are Christians who have night terrors, depression, uh, all kinds of vexations, fear, intense fear from nowhere, because they dip their toe in a well they should not have been fishing in. That is good advice. I've read several Christian-authored books on the occult over the years, you do not mess with that. There's all kinds of scripture. I just read you one. But if you explore this, you will find this out. Stay away from witchcraft. Stay away from ghosts and spirits. The Bible says, I don't care what the medium down the road says. The Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't wander around telling people where the gold's hidden or any of that stuff. Or telling, it, that is false. Those aren't really ghosts. Those are demons, my friends. Stay away from them. Don't listen to them. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. If, if you want to call upon the name of the Lord, you will be blessed. If you want to ask or inquire to the Lord, you will be blessed. If you ask or inquire to a witch or a sorcerer or a fortune teller or an astrologer, you're getting into bad territory. That is my message. That's the message I didn't even want to talk about. The Lord put it on my heart. The people need to know this stuff. As a tree falls, there it lies. It doesn't wander the earth and, and haunt people and do things like that. Those are not departed spirits of people. When a spirit departs its body, it goes one place or another. 
Now, a false spirit may imitate that person and tell you details that are like, whoa, but that's evil. That's wrong. They're called familiar spirits. They're as old as time itself, and they are liars. They will take you away from the risen God. Stay away from ghosts. Stay away from witches. This is Reformation Day. This is the day the Lord has made, right? I don't care if you put on a costume and have some candy and enjoy yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, I'm not going to go radical one way or the other, but I will warn you, if you take it too far, Christians, and you dip your toe into the poison well, you're going to get burned. You're going to get demonized. It's going to play with your head. It's going to mess you up. And the Bible's warning you not to get involved in this stuff. I'm not saying it ain't real. Things move. Things go bump. It's demonic is what I'm telling you. I've uh, read extensively a book from Dr. Walter Martin, uh, one of my favorite. He was the equivalent of a biblical lawyer. Uh, he is smart. He's done his research. He's encountered many weird things. And he has employed the name of Jesus, and he has emerged victoriously time and time again, as well as many others. My favorite thing is when Jesus showed up and people who were in league with demons saw him, they fell at his feet and said, what are you doing here? It's not time yet. We're wandering around causing havoc, and now you're here. They recognized him immediately. Even though the scribes and Pharisees didn't know who he was, the demons knew very well who he was. And he says, what is your name? Get out of here. He casts them out with a word. They had nothing on him. Are you in Christ? Is he in you? Do you have his blood on you? Do you have his word? You have nothing to fear from the kingdom of darkness. Nothing. If you're getting night terrors, give that to the Lord. He'll take care of it. If you're having unexplained anxieties, give it to the Lord. He will help you. He will help you. The devil will destroy you. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life, and life more abundantly. No fear, no terror. Peace. And I just read you the end of the story. You're, all, you're bound for glory, all you guys. You have a good outcome. But somebody sees you on your bus, on your way to your good outcome, and they're like, Bleh. there goes your tire. <laughs> right? Now, a Christian... We get curious. We wander away. I've done it. Not, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody. Go to the Bible with this stuff. I don't believe in ghosts. To be absent from this body, you go one place or the other. Like Jesus told in Luke, uh, a rich man died and Lazarus died. It's the only parable I ever heard of that named someone, so I don't think it was so much a parable. One went to be comforted. One went to torment. They weren't, neither one of them were roaming the earth, shaking drawers and telling futures, right? When you die, my friends, you go one place or another. That is what the Bible teaches. I don't care if you like it or not. I'm just telling you the truth. Jesus came, suffered, and died to get you out of that fix. Don't you dare blame him. Don't you say, how could a loving God, how could a loving God, don't give me that. He got nailed to a cross and beat. There's your loving God. Forgive them. They know not what they do. There's your loving God. Jesus Christ himself. He did it for you and for me to get you out of that stuff. If we go headlong into it, it's not his fault. He came to seek and save the lost. And you, of course, you've heard it a million thousand times. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I just read you the end of the story about your everlasting life. No more curse. No more pain. You know, this is where you're headed. I'm trying to give you some good news. Don't look at me so sour here. You know, this is information to help you along. This is not condemnation. As far as I'm concerned, you know, um, I'll give you a true confession. Last week, I put on a Batman costume. It was the only, only day of the year that I actually got to be myself. Because <laughs> many of you know, I am Batman, of course. And I love my kids. I love my grandkids. And I don't mind our neighbors giving us free candy. That's awesome. And having a party and going around your neighborhood and getting to know your neighbors. That's swell. I can do that with a full heart 
Because this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and glad in it. I don't, you're a witch. Get away from me, man. You're a sorcerer. Sorry, no thanks. I'm just getting some candy, and I'm going home, and I'm going to rejoice because this is the day he's made. This is Reformation Day as far as I'm concerned. So that's how I roll. That's how I walk. I, I know, understand this camp. I understand this camp in the middle of the road. Camp. I, I've seen all of it. But guys, we don't need to be in dread or in fear or wagging our bony finger at somebody for doing this or not doing that. Let's stay away from the works of the devil. Let's rejoice. Give God the glory. And if any demons or devils or witches come at you, you just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, my King, my Lord, Holy Spirit dwells in me, ain't got nothing in you, and you got nothing in me. Have a nice day. How about that? That should put a smile on your face. This isn't bad news today, is it? Whew. <laughs> like I said, I did not, did not, did not want to talk about this today. Because I don't want to ever sound to you guys like I'm being condemning. Because who do I think I am to try to condemn any of you guys? The roads that I've taken amiss, <laughs> the things I've believed and unbelieved over the years. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had my things. It, it rests, you know me, right now, everything rests right here. This is how I live and move and have my being, right here. Uh, the Bible says avoid it. I say, yes, sir. The Bible says seek the things that are life-giving, seek the things that are of me, obey my commandment. I'll say, yes, sir, I'm going to go that way. I'm not going to be interested in the affairs of this world that want to drag me down and kill me. And I don't want that for you. I think, I think that's why God wanted me to tell you this, to reassure you. Stay away from ghosts, spirits, and witches. They're real. They're evil. They will never take you to God. Jesus paid a mighty, mighty price to get you to himself. Don't walk away from him. You stay on your bus. You sing your hymns. You have your Bible studies. The guy's coming. He's going to fix your tire, and you'll get back on the road. Trust him with all your heart. Be not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will change your tire. Wait, did I just add something? That's not, you're not supposed to do that, right? He will give you his life. He will show you the way. He's got you. You okay with that? Well, let me pray for you. I'd like to ask Mackenzie. She's in Pittsburgh right now. If she'd hurry up, maybe she could play the piano. <laughs> no, nah, I'm kidding. It's fine. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. This message was not meant to trouble anyone, Lord, to set them free, to give them a clear path and direction, to help them on their way, and to uh, exalt the fact that you are Lord and this is your day. So we trust in you, dear Lord. Set us free, enlighten us, show us the right path, Lord. Uh, show us the right way, help us shine in our neighborhoods, in our, in our state, and in our nation, so that we may give you glory. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you for these things. Everybody say, Amen.